Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their history, their music, specific albums and songs, uh, the group years, the solo years. It's an all-encompassing show. We cover what's happening in Beatle news every every show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this program. Hopefully you know my syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing. And also another podcast show, which is bi-weekly on the solo Beatles, called Talk More Talk. And I'm being joined by my two other regular co-hosts. First of all, our resident musicologist, who for many years worked at the New York Times in their classical department. And he's also the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop. And got that something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And he always writes for various publications today as a freelance writer for the Wall Street Journal and uh, other publications, especially Beatle fan, who he's been with for several decades now. <laughs> and that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. Also, we have with us a veteran DJ of New York Radio who's been at WFUV for over 35 years now. He is their resident Beatles expert over there. And he's done a lot of tremendous interviews through the years. And it's our pleasure to welcome... Darren DeVivo. And it's my pleasure to be here once again. Hi, Ken. Hi, Alan. Howdy, everyone. On the program this time, we're going to be covering what are our favorite Beatle and solo Beatle album covers. And I'm curious to find out between Alan and Darren what those are. Uh, So many to pick from, so many that you could say are iconic album covers. And we'll have that discussion in just a bit. We also have a special interview that we did just recently with John Kosh, who was the creative director for Apple Records. And he actually designed the album cover for the Beatles' Abbey Road album. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. But as usual, we'll get to, first of all, the latest in Beatle news. And uh, actually, as we're recording this show, on October the 10th, yesterday, was uh, John Lennon's birthday, what would have been his 79th birthday, as well as Sean Lennon's 44th birthday yesterday. So Yoko Ono posted something online. She said, happy birthday, John and Sean. John, you are still with us and giving us wisdom and happiness when it's much needed. I love you all, Yoko. And as usual, as what's been happening for several years now, the uh, Imagine Peace Tower was lit in Mm -hmm. Reykjavik, Iceland, which starts on John's birthday. And so uh, Yoko has been a part of that, starting that tradition for several years. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's definitely something I hope that someday I have the opportunity to see, you know, in person. My daughter was in Iceland. Uh, I think last year, and saw it from a distance. I'm not sure where she was in Iceland, but at night I made it a point to text her and say, can you look around? Hmm. And she said, yeah, I spot, I see something out in the, the horizon. So it must be beautiful, and hopefully uh, someday. Yeah. And in other news, and this really excites me, a brand new Paul McCartney single is coming out. November 22nd for Black Friday, and it's also a part of Record Store Day. It's two songs, two more songs, from the Egypt Station Sessions. One song is called Home Tonight. The other song is called In a Hurry. The songs will be available on Vinyl 45, and 12,000 copies will be made, and it also will be available digitally. So I know, in the case of Alan, he's been saying to me privately every week, we need more Egypt Station material. <laughs> oh, it was, was I saying that? Hmm. Yes. You know, the Traveler's Edition was not enough <laughs> for Alan. Yeah, so I, I apparently to... uh, sleepwalk in the middle of the night, get on the phone and call Ken and say this. <laughs> <laughs> Alan's looking for more stuff to put in his suitcase. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. But uh, it's pretty incredible. I thought that we got all the material 
from uh, from Egypt Station. But I remember Paul saying something to the effect that there were 25 tracks altogether. So there's there may be more than these two songs still left to hopefully be released in the future. But um, this was a big surprise to me. I certainly didn't yeah. see this coming. I think with all of Paul's albums and in, in terms of their outtakes, uh, the cupboard is never bare. You know, mm. there's there's always more. There's just always more. It's kind of an endless, um, you know, it's it, it's incredible how much he writes and records, makes a finished recording of or a close to finished recording of that he needs only to touch up if he decides he wants to put it out. Uh, and yeah. also how he'll, you know, once once the album's over, it's not like he forgets about these songs and they're dead. I mean, he can return to them three, four, five years later. And, uh, you know, as we've seen, I mean, it's, you know, things like uh, My Carnival finally coming out in, you know, the 80s. Yeah. Uh, recorded in 74, 75, well, 75. So, uh, or Frank Sinatra's party. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, more Beatle news. The world is responding in a big way to the 50th anniversary release for the Beatles' Abbey Road album. In the UK, Abbey Road shot up to number one on the official album's chart, while in the US, Abbey Road climbs up to number three on Billboard's top 200 album charts. These all reflect sales figures of all the different configurations for Abbey Road in CD, vinyl, and digital releases so an impressive showing right there all right a yoko ono retrospective art exhibit called remembering the future is running right now through october 27th at the everson museum in syracuse new york also neil innes who was a great guest on our show has just released a new solo album called Nearly Really. It's been released on CD and you can get it at neilennis.media or at nearlyreally.com. Of course, Neil Ennis of Ruddles fame and the Bonzo Dog Band and someone who's helped out Mighty Python quite a lot through the years. Uh, Ken McNabb, who was also a great guest on this show, his recent book exploring in detail the tumultuous and eventful year of 1969 for the Beatles and in the end, the name of that book, it's just been reissued in paperback form. A new movie is out in theaters right now called Lucy in the Sky, starring Natalie Portman and John Hamm. This movie has nothing to do with the Beatles. But there is a subdued cover version of the song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, featuring Irish singer Lisa Hannigan, and that's on the soundtrack. There are rumors going on right now about Paul possibly playing the Glastonbury Festival next year. He's considering it. And also returning to Tel Aviv next year for a concert. Uh, some other news. A new live CD by the Ivies, the band that became Badfinger, recorded in 1968, has just come out with their cover of the Beatles' Lady Madonna, along with three of their original songs, Storm in a Teacup, and Her Daddy's a Millionaire, and No Escaping Your Love. And this was recorded at the Thingamajig Club in Reading, England on September the 6th, 1968, shortly after signing to the Beatles' Apple Records. And apparently Apple has approved this release. And we have the news of two major passings. Uh, first, there's actress Anna Quayle, who was known for being in the, the BBC children's TV show Grange Hill, also in the films Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and Casino Royale. And uh, however, to Beatle fans, she will always be remembered for her role in A Hard Day's Night as a woman named Millie who uh, recognizes John Lennon in the hallway going undercover. And I think we all pretty much have that dialogue memorized, don't we? <laughs> she looks more like him than I do. That's right. Anna passed away at the age of 86 after battling dementia. She actually died on August the 16th, but I guess news just uh, was reported about this only recently in the past week. And finally, everybody knows about the passing of legendary drummer Ginger Baker. Innovator on drums with uh, Cream and Blind Faith, 
Beatle Connections with Ginger Baker uh, while recording the Band on the Run album in Lagos, Nigeria. Ginger invited Wings to record at his new studio, uh, ARC Studios, ARC Studios. And they recorded Picasso's last words there. Also, Denny Lane was in Ginger Baker's Air Force for a brief time in 1971. And uh, with Cream, the band recorded Badge, of course, written by George and Eric Clapton with Ginger on drums. Paul McCartney issued this statement on Twitter. He said, Ginger Baker, great drummer, wild and lovely guy. Sad to hear that he died, but the memories never will. Ringo said, God bless Ginger Baker, incredible musician, wild and inventive drummer, peace and love to his family. And in Rolling Stone magazine, Ringo remembered that a few times Ginger joined Ringo and the All-Stars on stage when Jack Bruce was with the band. Mm. And Ringo introduced Ginger on stage by saying, ladies and gentlemen, 2% cream. <laughs> <laughs> So, any thoughts about Ginger Baker, guys? Um, I've always been a huge fan of his, and uh, it was just very sad. I mean, you knew it was coming because he was very ill. I have—I don't know if anyone has seen the um, the film uh, Be, uh, "Beware of Mr. Baker." Is that the name of it? I believe. Mm -hmm. I've seen it once. I got to go back and watch it again. Uh, very entertaining uh, look at uh, Ginger Baker. May he rest in peace. And it was a lot of fun playing Crest Rat and Warthog on WFUV the other night. <laughs> <laughs> Any thoughts, Alan? Uh, yeah, I mean, he was a spectacular drummer and, and pretty much the... Um, he was sort of the person that the idea of a virtuoso drummer was patterned after, you know. I mean, um, he, he and, uh, you know, John Bonham and a, a few others at that time, you, you know would have the big drum solo that might last 20 minutes. And, uh, you know, that was a, uh, it, it changed rock concerts in a way. Uh, but the thing about Ginger and also John Bonham is that they had so much going on in their drum parts that people who might have originally looked askance at the idea of a 20 minute drum solo began to see the point of it. Uh, but also, you know, in, uh, the Beatles connection, uh, with Lagos, um, I think, uh, what we're beginning to sort of discover in our research for that part of the book is that, uh, I think Paul really would have wanted to record more, at Ginger Studio, but EMI exerted a lot of pressure, you know, to the effect that Paul should be recording at EMI Studio in Lagos. But I think Ginger's was a lot better equipped and a lot more modern, uh, had better connections with a lot of people. Uh, when, you know, Paul sort of ran into this incident with uh, Fela Kuti about, uh, you know, Fela going on the radio, sort of wondering whether Paul was just in Africa to steal the black man's music. Um, you mm. know, Ginger really interceded on that because Ginger and Kuti were close and uh, got, you know, uh, Kuti to come to one of Paul's sessions and see what was going on. And, uh, you know, and, and he sort of felt better about it. But, uh, you know, I think without Ginger there, that could have been a much more precarious incident for Paul. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on there in, in that, you know, uh, Ginger-Paul relationship in Nigeria uh, that Ooh. I think will, will come out um, more, it's certainly by the time our book comes out. Very interesting. Yeah. You know, uh, from what I heard, uh, Ginger really wanted Wings to record the entire album there, and he was disappointed that they didn't. Right. So, um, And there was yeah. a lot of pressure from EMI. In fact, you know, the way Ginger tells it, EMI, EMI's studio director in Lagos went to him and said, we're going to put you out of business. You know, we, can, we can't have two studios here. It's, it's us, EMI. We're, wow. We're the big guys, yeah. 
uh, we really wanted to talk to Ginger about this and got in touch with his daughter uh, eventually, who basically told us that, uh, that Ginger was not well. This was months and months ago. Uh, so we had been hoping that maybe he would get well, but it didn't sound like it was uh, likely to happen. And, uh, you know, Ginger writes about this in his book, one of his books. I can't remember the title, but uh, we've, you know, sort of read the, the information there. And there's also a film called, I think, Ginger Baker in Africa or Ginger Baker in Lagos, something like that. Uh, you You can probably find it around where he discusses this too so uh that's as as close as we could get to actually ginger's own words on the subject well, yeah i know he was friends with the mccartneys and he went to see them during the wings over america tour there's a photo of him backstage with them mm-hmm. so um i guess he kept up the friendship with with the mccartneys at least for a while anyway mm-hmm yeah also finally a reminder that ringo's new album what's my name comes out in just a few weeks october the 25th i also uh saw online on amazon that the photo book the new photo book from ringo another day in the life was postponed to october the 15th maybe because of the abbey road box set coming out at the same time so uh next week hopefully uh ringo's book of photos should be coming out and we should also be hearing pretty soon about the uh next mccartney remaster box set which from what we've been hearing should be flaming pie but we will be finding out pretty soon about that mm-hmm. okay so before we get to our main topic which will be Beatle and solo Beatle album covers and our favorites among them. It's kind of ironic that we happen to have gotten an interview with someone who's involved with album covers. John Koch, who was the creative director for Apple Records, who designed the front cover and actually the back cover as well for Abbey Road. And we're going to listen to our conversation with him, which runs about 20 minutes. And then... We'll come right back and and talk about our favorite album covers from the Beatles. All right, so let's listen to our interview with John Kosh. We're all honored here at uh, Things We Said Today, and I know I can speak for Alan and for Ken, uh, to have the man who was the creative director of the Beatles album, Abbey Road, an album I think most of you are familiar with. uh, (laughs) Never heard of it. (laughs) (laughs) That was, the, that was the first Rolling Stones album after... <laughs> anyway, anyway. And uh, also the uh, creative director for Apple Records. And those are just two of the things uh, that he has accomplished in a career that continues on today. It gives me great pleasure to welcome to Things We Said Today, John Kosh, better known as Kosh. How are thank you? you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm honored to be with you. And uh, this is a, a big week with Abbey Road, uh, the actual anniversary being, what is the actual release date in the UK? It's September 27th? Six. 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 Oh, really? Here in the changes. US. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. US is October 1st, 50 years ago, the album that uh, ended up being the final one recorded by the Beatles. And uh, you were the creative director of, of uh, this iconic album cover. Uh, if it isn't, the most iconic album cover ever. It's probably got competition from another album called Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band. Well, yeah, Sgt. Pe- Sergeant Pepper opened the floodgates as far as, you know, uh, the artists sort of taking control of their, you know, their, their product on their album covers and their promotion and publicity and whatever else. But the thing that made Abbey Road iconic, which we didn't realize at the time, because all we had to do was, you know, try and get something out on time and pay the rent, uh, was the fact that it's probably the most parodied of all albums. And if I had a wall full of them, I'd be really happy. Because let's face it, we've had... We've had well, you, just, you, you know how many p- covers have been, you know, have been produced oh, sure. uh, from Sesame Street to, um, yeah, to Red Hot Chili Peppers and whatever else, which is probably the funniest of them all, if you know it. But, still, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> but also including one from one of the Beatles themselves, actually, Paul. Yes, right, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, because when you're creating things, when, you know, as I say, you're not realizing what you're doing, you know, it's like 
well, you do realise what, exactly what you're doing because you're such a, you're, you're your own worst, worst enemy and you've got to make sure it actually works and looks really f- works and sells the record because whilst the fro- after all, what we're trying to do is to get people to pick up the record and know exactly what's in the grooves and that's what we do. But, you know, when you sort of, sort of you know, some, it's, 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 to some extent, Abbey Road was serendipity, but when it comes to other things like Simple Dreams for Linda Ronstadt and Hotel California, they are incredibly well planned out and a lot of work and background goes into them. But the point is what you've got to do is you've just got to make sure that when people buy a record, particularly in those days of 12-inch squares and 15% of your sales are impulse, they pick something up and say, oh, i got to have it. <laughs> That's what we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's interesting here is that I recently read that there were uh, – and we'll get into the photograph and how you designed the back cover and whatnot – but um, once the, uh, I guess, the mock-up was, was developed, uh, EMI had concerns about the fact that they said nothing on the cover. It didn't say anything. It didn't say Beatles. It didn't say Abbey Road. It was just a picture of the, uh, of the guys crossing the street, crossing the road. And uh, the higher-ups at EMI were c- a bit concerned about that, weren't they? Well, I think that's putting it mildly. <laughs> but, but hadn't they been paying attention when they put out Beatles for Sale, which also doesn't have anything on the cover? Well, I don't right. know, because I mean, Beatles for Sale, um, actually, there's so, many, there's so many things for it. That was the very, Beatles for Sale was the very first one, wasn't it? Or second one in America. Hang on. I'm not quite sure the uh, chronology of this. Uh, uh, Beatles this, for Sale was, was the fourth in UK, and it didn't come out in America. That's right. Okay, got it. Right. Okay. But so the, what actually happened with Abbey Road was uh, it occurred to me, because um, we just we were following the White Album, and I was actually working on Get Back uh, before it was called Let It Be, which was going to be the Black Album, which was the exact opposite of the White Album, because it was going to be their swan song. So what what actually happened was Abbey Road suddenly got inserted into it and it had to come out on the same time slot, okay? Which means it was a big panic because I finished Get Back, which, as as you know, got turned into Let It Be. Uh, So the point was we were, like, rushing around at this moment to see what's going on. And, I, 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 you know, I listened to the album. I was very fortunate. I had John Lennon brought up an acetate to Derek Taylor's office on the fifth floor of apple and put this record on and they made god and in my opinion and it's certainly my opinion that abbey road is the best beatles album ever made I mean, i'm biased of course you know obviously so the, the whole structure of this thing was built in a sort of madcap sort of creative sort of i don't know what's the word fountain of uh, stuff coming out i mean we've got billy preston we've got Mary Hopkin, we got Badfinger, we got, you know, James Taylor upstairs, actually, only for a very brief time. So all this stuff was like, you know, I'm a very, I'm a very young guy. I'm mean, like 24, 23, somewhere around there. And to suddenly get thrust into, coming out of the Royal Opera, to suddenly get thrust into this sort of, you know, crazy world of creativity and fun and hard work, uh, I, you know, I mean, it's just it's very, very difficult for me to sort of actually recap how some of these things evolved. Um, but Abbey Road was serendipitous, you know, as opposed to the usual planning that one does now. And it was the fact you're working for the Fab Four. What more can you ask for? You know. But they did actually well, plan to go to Nepal and have it shot on Mount Everest originally. Yes, right. right. Because I mean, because Jeff Emmerich was to smoke uh, Ever- uh, Everest sort of mental cigarettes. I think I'm not quite sure how that worked. I wasn't involved in that part of the creative process. Ah, okay. You know, I spoke to John Curlander once, who was an engineer on the session, and he said, and it, it, it's a little bit little different than what people say now, that mm-hmm. um, regardless of Jeff Emmerich's cigarettes. <laughs> the, the the feeling really was that this was going to be their final album and that they were going out at their peak and that that's why they were going to fly to Everest and um, that that was oh. his feeling anyway. That's interesting. I didn't get that. I mean, I didn't know that story uh, because I, you know, Get Back, Let It Be, uh, was going to be their swan song at that particular point. Mm-hmm. So Abbey Road, that had been recorded already because it was done in Twickenham Studios and whatever else with the movie. And I was working on the posters at the time for the movie. Right. Um, so, in fact, Abbey Road was their last album. Uh, there's no doubt about it. But because at this point, Apple is kind of starting to fall apart, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, because yeah, we could see it coming. But then when Abbey Road came out, we thought, oh, wait a minute, this might be the grand resurrection. But, of course, it wasn't because Ringo was off making his movies, The Magic Christian or something like that. Paul has got his, like, two albums out, the one with the cherry cover, which was Bacardi, of course, and Ram. And so the thing, everything, everything, everyone's going off and making their own albums. I mean, Ringo was doing Buco of Blues, which was doing that in Nashville. So it was a mad scramble at this point because I'm I'm responsible now for sort of making sure that the printers get their artwork on time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and of course, who gets the blame if it doesn't? You know, if the, if they haven't finished mixing, the art director. <laughs> um, were, uh, were you only involved with the art design? Because I've read online that you were involved with promotion and publicity too. Yes, Chris, I'm doing posters and, uh, you know, uh, 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 ads that were appearing in Melody Maker and, uh, you know, New Musical Express and BAM and things like that. Yeah. No, no, I was, I was doing a lot of stuff. It was just, uh, uh, it was, yeah. I mean, that was, it wasn't only that, it was just flyers were going out and, you know, uh, just stuff that were going out to, you know, to record stations, I mean, to the radio stations. Yeah, so I was like frantic and having a lot of fun, don't get me wrong. <laughs> So were you working directly with Derek Taylor? Yeah. Yeah, I was working with Derek. And I was more, I was working with Ringo a lot because I did I mean, eventually four albums with five albums with him. But I was working mostly with John Lennon. Because hmm. we did the War Is Over campaign. That's how it all started. Mm-hmm. Hmm. <laughs> so we started with that. And he liked my minimalist sort of approach to design at the time. And we did things like, you know, the John Lennon diary. And we did the John Lennon, John and Yoko calendar and we're inserting things in the magazine i was working for at the time art and artists you know the the john and yoko floppy discs were being inserted so there's a lot of stuff going on outside apple at the time because i was also working for the stones and the who you know so there's a a lot of stuff going on at the time i don't know how i had the energy to be honest (laughs) (laughs) were you involved at all with the decision which to me often felt like it might have sort of been an afterthought the decision, oh, let's just take a picture crossing the street, we'll go down the block and we'll cross the road a couple of times and that we'll use as our al- album art. Were you involved with the decision making on let's use a picture crossing Abbey Road as the well, cover? Well, no, because th- to be honest, because I hadn't seen, because uh, my dear friend Ian McMillan, he and I were working on the Plastic Ono Band and a few other projects because he's really coming out of Yoko's camp, you know, which is how we met because I'm working with Lenin. But the decision to, I was under the impression at the time that Ian went off and got on his ladder and they held up the traffic and he took some pictures. Uh, there was really more, nothing more than publicity pictures until all of a sudden it became apparent that they needed an album cover to insert this because we've got a new album now. Um, like today's Monday and they wanted the art on Wednesday, you know. So the decision making at this point was Ian and myself and a light box looking at the frames and deciding which one would work the best. Right. And, you know, pulls out a step or he's got, you know, da, da, da. there's also something something going on. You know, Ringo doesn't look good. Or his tote co- coattails, because he looked like an undertaker, were flying up. But the point was <laughs> that what, what we were doing was just trying to very find the very, very picture for an album that had to be on the streets in so many weeks. You know, which mm-hmm. means pressing and printing and trucks running and warehouses and all that sort of stuff. Because that's one of the jobs that I had was to sort of kind of make sure that all got coordinated, you know, with um, with the powers that be at EMI and Apple. Good thing there wasn't any pressure on you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, no pressure at all. <laughs> so what about the back? Well, yeah. the back was another one of Ian sort of, uh, he sort of took that shot, you know, whatever else. The back never had the word the Beatles on it when I first left it, but then it popped up again. So now the back was just a follow up because the back actually says the street sign. That's a real street sign from 1890 or something. It's at Abbey Road, you know, mm-hmm. which is right outside the studio. So that was just a B roll, if you like to call it, you know, because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. by that time, I think the Beatles have probably got fed up with going back and forth over the streets and the piece have got fed up with holding up the traffic. And so he just went round with his Hasselblad shooting more pics. And it turns into a great back cover, doesn't it? Well, I have yeah. no idea who that girl mm. is. At least I don't. You know. 
<laughs> did the Beatles get involved with any of this decision making, or did they just trust your judgment? Well, they were trusting my judgment. In the end, uh, the fact that I didn't want to put um, the Beatles' name on the cover, uh, Neil Aspinall, who was uh, it was. Uh, he decided in the end that was OK. You know, I do remember when we were looking at the pictures that John Lennon popped over and I remember Ringo looked over them. And uh, I don't I don't know where George was at the time, but George would sort of go along with anything at the time because he's such a sweet man. <laughs> hmm. He trusted you. <laughs> How much dealing with the Be- the other Beatles or, or all four of them as a group besides Lennon did you have? Well, it was constant because they were all, as I say, they were always in the building running up and down the stairs. Paul wasn't there so much. Ringo was always there. John was always there. And George was always there. I mean, uh, George, I mean, uh, Paul would pop in, you know, and because he was working on his own projects with the head of Apple Records at the time, which was Jack Oliver, and they were doing, you know, the McCartney album and the Ram album and whatever else, which, you know, because there was this problem because three Beatles are you know, within the Alan Klein legal camp. And Paul, of course, was, you know... That's what I was going to ask you, actually, because there, there there was all of that tension, plus at the same time they were trying to acquire Northern songs and right. uh, and yeah. uh, Brian Epstein and, and Nems. Um, and yet they well, Brian seemed... Brian died by then. Yeah. Right, but because he had died and uh, Clive was wanted to sell Nems because the estate tax was so huge, the Beatles uh. wanted to acquire it, but then someone else got involved there was a, a trust um a, a, tr- a, a bunch of stockbrokers fundamentally that that wanted to bid on it too and so it was a battle between the beatles and it them. was a and- battle and the whole thing was like we knew this was going on but there's there's a subtext to this and that is that because paul and john were not supposed to be working or talking to each other in the middle of all this there was for some contractual reasons and you probably know more than i do uh, they had to come up with another single, okay? The B side was Old Brown Shoe. The A side was Ballad of John and Yoko, mm-hmm. all right? So I had to present the single cover to John and Paul at Abbey Road Studios, okay? Mm-hmm. And I walked into Abbey Road B, um, and there's Ringo's drum kit sitting in the corner, and Paul is on the drum kit. Mm-hmm. John's on rhythm, Okay. And they're getting on, like, fine. It's almost like the old days of the cavern. You know, they're getting on fine. And then, of course, Paul's going to go now and play bass, and John's going to play lead. And they pulled out the uh, the Battle of John and Yoko, which is credited as the Beatles, but it was really just John and Paul. Right. I went into that studio thinking this is going to be weird. They were having a wonderful time together. And this is right in the middle of the troubles. Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah. ask you, because they seemed able to compartmentalize, you know, when they were playing they were playing and that seems to have been a reasonable amount of fun for them whereas the business stuff was something else entirely well, i think you're right you know because i mean i used to i i was in new york a lot you know uh, with i was working with alan not working with alan klein but trying to get the let it be album out through united artists so i had an office on you know 42nd 45th 46th 54th street um and uh you know so i that was very much of the Lennon camp. And it was also for Phil Spector's, you know, everything was going round and round because John wanted to bring out a single every week, you know, <laughs> like, in, like the Instant Karma single, uh, which was topical, which in those days with all the, you know, and I was going to do black and white sleeves and they were going to press the singles and whatever else, which in those days was impossible because by the time it came out, it would no longer be topical. Right. Today, of course, it's easy because you just download it, you know. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But anyway, all that was going on at the same time. So, um, but Paul was definitely not involved at this particular point. But when it came to that one contractual, I think it's contractual, and you can, you know, talk about it, it was the fact they had to get another single out and they had to be together because Ringo was off making Magic Christian. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe another movie. George had kind of stormed out after the Twickenham sort of thing when they were doing Let It Be. And so it's just two Beatles. And they were like having a whale of a time. Quote. (laughs) What was it like to work for Apple, for the Apple artists? Was it very frustrating because they were putting out really some great music and it wasn't really going very far? Was it very chaotic? From what no, you it was chaotic, but, but no, and it wasn't chaotic because it, this is a business, you know. 
And as you, as I said before, you know, accountants have to put things together, b- buses have to run, I mean, trucks have to run, things have to be pressed, albums have to be, you know, covers have to be printed. It wasn't chaotic so much as uh, hard work, but everyone seemed to sort of enjoy it there. Everybody, you know, because I was working with Mary Hopkin and Billy Preston, of course, was always a joy. But no, no, it was all, it was like chaotic, maybe, yes. But it was a purpose and everybody seemed to have one thing in goal, the music. And mm-hmm. is it good? Yeah. And I think everybody was involved in getting, making sure that nothing went out that was inferior. Mm-hmm. That's my opinion. Uh- Kosh, I've a, uh, we have just a few moments left with you, um, and uh, I have, a, let's see, seven or eight pages of questions to add. No, oh, good. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, coming after sandwich. the very elaborate Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band uh, right. and the White Album, and the White Album came with a poster and individual photographs of the band members, Abbey Road didn't have anything. There, was, no, there wasn't there was no, a gate. There was no time. There was absolutely uh, no time. As simple as that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. If you know, if you're given a commission on on Monday, I'm I'm kind of making this up, but and you're told you need an, the, the the album has to go to the printers on Wednesday, you haven't got time to do all the things that I enjoy doing now, you know, like Donovan and posters and things and pop ups and whatever else. It was no time. And the point was, we were following Sergeant Pepper, which opened the gates as far as great, you know. This inclusive designs concerned, and then the white album, which had you know the the, the great the white, this Richard Hamilton poster inside. I mean, all those things. So it was a little worrisome because I was already planning, let it be, because that comes if you can find it. That comes in a black box with a hundred and sixty page book. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. yes, right. Well, that's how that was being planned, because that time frame I'd already been working on that for weeks. So now we have a 160-page book designed, you know, with a box with a formery and then an album on top. And then the whole thing came in another box and then it was shrink-wrapped and all this sort of stuff. That was just about ready to go when Abbey Road was sprung on us. And it was the same deadline, you know? Oh, right, (laughs) right. Um, Now that's why it's a simple, simple piece, which, as I said earlier, became has become an icon, which we didn't realize at the time. We didn't realize at the time. In fact, I realized when I first heard the record, I thought, oh, my God, <laughs> this really deserves more, but we haven't got time. <laughs> and uh, just in, in, in conclusion, uh, from my end, Her Majesty, those early pressings did not have the title of the song on the label, uh, right. on the on the record label, on at least in the U.S., side two, and on the back cover of the album, Her Majesty was missing. Yes. Why was that? I, you know, I've got no, I, I don't know how to answer that. I've no idea. That's a Beatle decision. It's not my decision. Or it's a George <laughs> Martin decision. Or it's a, they, I don't know. <laughs> they invented the hidden track. <laughs> yes. We, you know, all that stuff. The uh, things going back was playing. His, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> all right. Kosh, thank, thank you so much. Yes, thanks. Uh, thank you. This is fun. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Toodaloo. Bye. Thanks. Bye. And that was it. Our interview with John Kosh, who likes to be known just as Kosh. A uh, pretty impressive career he has had. And uh, apart from working on Abbey Road, he mentioned some other albums that he worked on. But if you look at his website, you'll see album covers that he designed. There's a lot more work that goes into album covers sometimes than you realize. And even just talking about the Abbey Road album cover, just whether or not to have the Beatles name on it was an issue or uh, just the name of the album, Abbey Road. But he designed album covers for the uh, the Eagles, like Hotel California, The Long Run. Who's Next was an album cover he designed. A whole bunch of uh, album covers for Jimmy Buffett. Uh, what did you guys think of the interview? You know, it was it was interesting hearing his perspective, and it's always great to get another you know voice from that era giving us their impression of what went on. Um, I think some of his memories are slightly inaccurate. Um, They were not contractually obligated to put out another single at the time, A Ballad of John and Yoko, having released the Get Back single only a week before they recorded Ballad of John and Yoko. But, you know, uh, I'm not going to nitpick uh the interview i mean this is uh 50 years ago and uh you know people's memories are what they are but i think you know he he had some valuable insights for us and um i was happy to talk to him 
Yeah. Darren, how about you? Uh, I found it interesting that Get Back, which became Let It Be, was very much still on the table at that point in the late summer of 69. And a lot of the folks uh, within Apple, from publicity to art department and everything, were preparing for Get Back to come out when Abbey Road was sprung upon them, which I found very fascinating. And that, of course, I've always wondered this for many years after the elaborate covers uh, that had come before Abbey Road, especially Sgt. Pepper, especially the White Album. And even if you want to throw in something like the U.S. Magical Mystery Tour with the book, um, you, you look at all those albums and then here is the iconic Abbey Road album. You look at the packaging and there's nothing there. There's no gatefold. There's no artwork on the inner sleeve. There's no lyrics. There's no giveaway posters, no uh, cutouts like it's Sgt. Pepper. There's nothing. Why? A simple case where the Beatles said, oh, here's our next album. And you got a couple of weeks to get it prepared and out in the stores. In a nutshell, uh, that was that was it. And then, boom, here we have this iconic yet another iconic album from from the Beatles. And, you know, it was that. Uh, you know, that much of a whirlwind uh, event, getting that in stores, uh, you never would have thought, you know, that it was done that way. Yeah, there was a deadline that had to be met and a lot of decisions had to be made quickly. So, um, yeah, very interesting interview right there. Uh, sometimes I think his memories are kind of clouded because so many things happened to him within the span of a few years, so many projects that he worked on mm-hmm. within the Beatles. And I think sometimes he kind of, maybe mix them up together or tried to place them in the same timeline. But um, still. And it's not as if his life has been uneventful in the 50 years since either, you know, looking at all yeah. those album covers. So, yeah. Yeah. But thank you, John, for, uh, or Kosh, for uh, granting us this uh, really nice interview. So on we go with our main topic for the show this time out. We're going to talk about album covers from the Beatles through the years, group and solo, and we're all going to pick our favorite one from each of the Beatles individually and our favorite Beatle group album cover. So why don't we start, first of all, with uh, Darren. Let's, let's, let's do... Should we do the group first or a solo one? Group. We'll do group first. Okay. What's your favorite Beatles group album cover? Abbey Abby? Road. And why Alan, would you're that next. be? No, I'm <laughs> No, Abbey Road, really. Uh, and 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 I don't. I couldn't tell you why, because if you really look at, uh, especially after hearing the interview on how so many of the ideas for the way Abbey Road looks, uh, so many of the ideas were really like last minute, quick. What do we should do with this? Do it this way. Okay, done. And yet it ended up being this. Uh, old time iconic piece of art, piece of rock history. Uh, but if you look at the album covers, nothing to it. The band is crossing the street. What's the big deal? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But yet, wow, it actually, in some regards, tops Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band, an album cover that most will say because it's an easy and uh, obvious pick, is the one that uh, is the eye catcher. Yet, here's a picture of the band crossing the street and you know, you can make the case that that's more iconic. Uh, Abbey Road's always been my favorite. And also probably because I was uh, how old I was when it came out. I was at that. I always point to, you know, when I had turned five in 1970, I was already very aware of the Beatles. I was very drawn in to them, uh, to the music, to how the records physically looked. I don't know why, whatever, whatever, however that happens in a human that something, you know, that they gravitate to at such a young age. And, uh, uh, that with three albums, the Hey Jude compilation, Abbey Road and, and, uh, let it be that com- branded themselves in my brain. I could make an argument that I could pick one of the other ones, uh, uh, and make it like three of my, are my favorites, but you got to go with one, you go with Abbey Road. I mean, it's just, ridiculously simple and incredibly effective yeah it's it's kind of strange in a way that sometimes a simple idea or a very spontaneous idea can work just as well as something that's really elaborate right 
So, uh, which I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, it's a, it's interesting. I've been going since we decided on this topic back and forth in my head. What is it that Abbey Road has? I'm not the only person who would pick Abbey Road. Um, what is it that Abbey Road has that Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band didn't have? Because that cover is, you don't need me to say that that's off the charts. Same thing could be said for Revolver. Groundbreaking at the time, 1966. Mm-hmm. But yet, a photograph of the band crossing the street, in some eyes, kind of tops that in a way of it being iconic. You think uh, maybe in some way because of the symbolism that they're walking across from Abbey Road Studios? That never occurred to me till I was in much, much older many years later. It had already made its impact on me as, no joke, a five-year-old, a six-year-old, you know, staring at these uh, at the album covers. And that was the one that was like, oh, oh, oh you know, and... I mean, right down to little things like how come it didn't say Her Majesty on the back cover of my copy of Abbey Road. Um, <laughs> fascinated with little things, picky little things that mean nothing to nine and a half out of ten people. Like, look at all the song titles they squeezed into the cut open apple on side two. Mm. You know, an impressionable five year old and Abbey Road, the front cover hit me uh, like a ton of bricks that you know i would still say that that's the one to today for me yeah well it's the most parodied album cover of all time so evidently the world must uh must be recognizing that album cover in in a way that you have right and appreciating it um alan how about you yeah okay i mean you know i looked at all of the beatles covers and at a certain point uh as i was going through them i had picked every single one of them, Uh, you know, and had an argument for why I thought that would be the one. And, you know, and with Abbey Road, sort of, um, if you want simple, I mean, with the Beatles is simple. Please, please me is simple. Um, Really up through help, they're pretty simple. And, uh, but I'm going to go with the um, easy and obvious Sergeant Pepper, because when it really comes down to it, in my view, Sgt. Pepper is the greatest album cover ever made by anybody, and therefore it has to be, you know, just logically the greatest album cover of the Beatles. This thing is just packed with stuff to look at. I mean, it's, you know, just absolutely everything about it, from identifying all those people to the fact that there were lyrics on the back, to the fact that the inner sleeve had that nice, you know, gradual red to pink to white design the cutout that came with it the the portrait of the band inside the record uh you know there was just just so many things to keep you busy with this cover i mean the white album had that too in a way even though the cover itself was white i mean there was the poster Mm. and the portraits and the the back of the poster with the lyrics but sergeant pepper was just, you know, this thing came out, I remember when it came out, I was like um, 13, and, uh, you know, it was just, it was just like a circus, you know? I mean, you got the guitar under where it says the Beatles, the left-handed guitar in, in yellow flowers, uh, welcome the Rolling Stones. It's just like this, that there isn't a millimeter of this album cover that doesn't have something to look at and think about or wonder about or, you know. Uh, so for me, it's just got to be Pepper. Hmm. Well, I'll have to agree with you there, Alan, um, pretty much for all the reasons you gave. I thought we were just going to talk about the front cover, but you were kind of referring to the whole packaging. Mm. But uh, when you think about all the work that was put into the front cover alone, it's just mind-boggling to have all their or many of their cultural heroes surrounding them. And then to also have this new band, Sgt. Pepper, in the center of the album, uh, the front uh, the front uh, album cover, and then the old Beatles, you know, to the side of them, and all those great figures around them. It was amazing in in front of a grave site, you know, and of course later on with the Paul is Dead rumor, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, you could apply so much to that album cover right there as well as the back cover and the gatefold. 
you know, and everything else, although that really should have nothing to do with why I love the album cover. But so much work was poured into that that front cover alone that uh, how can you not appreciate that? And, um, and yeah, it's something I mean, that could not be done today because we've got the technology to bang out a cover like that in an hour now. Yeah. You know, it's funny um, that you describe it as a grave site. Um, I always thought of it as a grave site as well, and that's how everyone always spoke of it. But when the reissue came out, everybody was speaking of it, you know, officially, as this is supposed to be a park where Sgt. Pepper's band is playing a concert, and these people behind them are the audience that has assembled to hear the Sgt. Pepper band. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, the gravesite thing still works for me. I mean, if you look at the Madame Tussauds wax beetles uh, off to the left of the Sergeant Pepper beetles, uh, Ringo looking really glum down at that, you know, beetles and flowers, which is supposed to be supposedly the grave. Uh, mm. And Paul with his hand on his shoulder, also looking down that way. George looking at it. Uh, you know, they're looking at the flowers. So... I don't know. I don't know whether the the concert is, uh, you know, was what they were actually thinking or whether the grave is what they were actually thinking. It looks like they were there to bury the Beatles as, you know, in the mop top Beatles. Uh, yeah. And yeah, this new new iteration of the Beatles as Sergeant Pepper is there burying the old Beatles. That's the way I always took it. Me too. And just having all those figures around them, and then for a long time not knowing who some of them were, that was part of the fun. Mm -hmm. Having uh, some of the contemporary music people like Bob Dylan in there, mm -hmm. and uh, Dion DiMucci. They even had Stu Sutcliffe <laughs> mm -hmm. on the front cover as well. So, And just knowing that these were all people that for the most part the Beatles admired, mm -hmm. I found that fascinating too. There's so much to bury yourself into with that front cover. And, no pun um, intended. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's such a work of art. And the thing is, with the Beatles album covers, all of them are iconic in their own way. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you could say that the White Album, how much work could there be on a front cover like that? Although I always looked at it as meaning it just reflected the music, Going from something that was very produced, like Sgt. Pepper, to something that was just the band and being, you know, the band themselves, stripped down, raw, most of the time, and the album reflected that, the album cover. That's how I looked at it anyway. Yeah. See, and considering all of these, I... I... I assumed that when that we weren't just talking about the front cover, you know, in the spirit of uh, Mr. Kosh being here and being the creative director and, and, and responsible for front and back and the whole package. Uh, uh, and also because, as we know from the White Album, uh, you know, quite a lot of uh, some of the discussions, for instance, at the the symposium in Monmouth that we all went to, there was a there was a session just on the cover. Uh, which included the poster and the portraits and and the whole concept because the whole concept was done, you know, together by you know the artist who was responsible for the cover. Um, so, yeah. So I was looking at it that way. I mean, I, I also considered the butcher cover, but I don't know that would that count because it was withdrawn so quickly. But it did come out. Yep. You know, Did it was out. a legitimate release. Yep. So, yeah, I would say that counts. Hmm. Yeah. You know, if we do this Although, again in a year, maybe I'll choose that one. <laughs> <laughs> Although I must say I have a lot more respect now. I really appreciate the Revolver album cover mm -hmm. so much more now. Uh, I kind of took it for granted for many years, but when you think about all the work that Klaus Vorman put into that, to combine drawings with actual photos, which I think was really unique, I'm pretty sure that hadn't been done for an album cover before. So, uh, you know, it, it was it was um, way ahead of its time. Yeah. My runner up was going to be Rubber Soul. Mm -hmm. I just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Well, next year we'll do the runners up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. OK. So why don't we do the solo albums now? And I'll start with Ringo. And uh, Alan, what would be your number one choice? 
Um, okay. Uh, with the solo albums, I found it a little difficult because um, a lot of, you know, Ringo's albums, most of them are not that interesting. But I did kind of like Roto Gravure. That's the one I chose. And in fact, if you look at the credits uh, on the inner sleeve of the LP, right down at the bottom, design and art direction, Kosh. So there hmm. you go. Um, you know, and the pho- photography is by uh, the cover photo is by David Alexander. It's Ringo holding a, uh, a, a, mic- a, a, a magnifying glass to his eye. It looks sort of like a monocle. It's a good portrait of Ringo. Um, even got the rings in there, <laughs> in his hand. Uh, you know, as he's holding the the uh, glass to his eye. I like the way that the title is printed. Roto Reviewer going from you know blue to purple to pink to you know it, it's sort of it's kind of a very mild color change all across it and. Uh, and the back cover is a photograph of the Apple office's door at Three Savile Row, uh, which, you know, like like Abbey Road, has attracted a lot of graffiti. Um, and this door is just a complete mess. And you can spend a lot of time looking at it, trying to sort of read the messages. Some of them are quite small because it's, you know, it's, it's the full door is covered uh, with them. And, uh, you know, I... I, I tend to like covers that you can spend a lot of time staring at and and getting uh you know new information from not particularly information about Ringo as such but uh you know the fact that he chose to put that on the back of his album um I think is you know just sort of interesting too and uh it, it's also a gatefold and it has you know lots of uh you know they look like polaroids almost i mean there's you know paul and linda are in there and uh you know a lot of the musicians that he worked with on the album uh very sort of informal photos and uh you know then then there's the inner sleeve that has the lyrics and it has uh you know portrait p- pictures of ringo all around the edges uh, on one side and then right in the middle on the other, all the credits. Uh, I just, I just think that as Ringo covers go, it's really well done and really interesting to look at. Yeah, I always love those photos on the inner gatefold. Mm-hmm. And now you can look back at them as, you know, pardon the pun, they are snapshots of that time mm-hmm. and all those musicians, you know, in 1976 when it came out. So many of them are no longer with us. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, it's nice to have that as part of the history of it all. Yeah. You know, Darren. Uh, good pick there, Alan. I considered Roto Gravure myself. Um, uh, I find that uh, a lot of I like a, um, I like a lot of Ringo's album covers, but there's very few that jump out and stand head and shoulders above the others. Uh, and I didn't want to pick Ringo because I felt like if I was going with Ringo, then I make a case for having to go with Dark Horse because the designs are very similar, uh, kind of parodying what they did with Sgt. Pepper. And I felt also when I was picking Ringo, if I picked Ringo, am I doing this because of the music within, which I feel it's Ringo's finest solo album? Uh, So looking through the covers, I came up with two that I don't think... uh, I actually, and forgive me for doing this, I came up with a with a a three-way tie uh, all for the same reason and talk about them all at once. Give more love, why not, and choose love. I just think they're great Ringo images. They capture who Ringo is beautifully. You know, Ringo's, you know, this you know, this great guy, this drummer, our friend. Uh, he's a peace and love guy. Simple, plain, and those album covers capture his personality really well. And the titles, of course, present on the covers, and less so with why not. You know, Ringo's always talking peace and love, give more love. It's a, it's a great look. It looks great framed. Same thing with Choose Love. Good colors on that one. And uh, I like Why Not because I just like the contrast of the black and white. And it's a good photo of Ringo. And for those reasons, they sort of stood stood out a little more than the other album albums 
albums did. I mean, most of Ringo's album covers, I I all like. Uh, I don't think I could say that for the other three. So I'll go with the the triumvirate of of Give More Love, Why Not, Choose Love, in no particular order as my favorite Ringo album cover, apostro- uh, parentheses, S. So we should tell the uh, listeners that we should refer them back to the Mark Hudson and post-Mark Hudson show <laughs> 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 while they're <laughs> contemplating your album covers. Yeah, because you've got Mark Hudson, Choose Love, and the other two albums post-Mark Hudson. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, you know, um, I kind of feel completely opposite uh, with your opinion there, Darren. Uh, it's funny. We just talked about how certain album covers and their simplicity work really well, like Abbey Road. I kind of felt like so much of Ringo's album covers post-Mark Hudson, you know, they seem pretty effortless. And not much imagination behind it. In my opinion, they're very simple. You know, in most cases, a headshot flashing the peace sign. You know, I'm going to go with the exact opposite of that, which since I voted for Sgt. Pepper, (laughs) I'm going to go with Ringo. Because there was so much work put behind that as well. And you got to give kudos to Klaus Vorman for um, all the drawing that he did for that front cover. Um, I really think he did a tremendous job. You can't help but think about Sgt. Pepper when you look at the Ringo album cover. But when you see all the different people that are there, and so many of them I can't identify at all. Obviously, you do have the Beatles there. I especially love in the the top right corner or close to it, you've got a swirling keyboard. And on one end is Billy Preston, and on the other end is Nicky Hopkins. If you look real carefully at the drawings of the people there, you can recognize Richard Perry, who produced the album. And since there's a guy there with glasses that says Ever Smiling, I'm figuring that's Bill Schnee, the engineer, because Ringo refers to him. And um, for you and me, Bill Schnee, Ever Smiling, Ever Loving. So, yeah, I love all the work that was poured into the front cover of that. And uh, as long as you mention the packaging, that booklet that accompanied the Ringo album with all the Klaus Vorman drawings for each song... Those are all really nice to have. Mm-hmm. For someone who had that much of a history with the Beatles, going back to their days in Hamburg and designing, you know, Revolver and later the Beatles anthology album covers, it's nice to have something else that Klaus Vorman was a part of. And um, how can you not notice this album cover? You know, there's so much effort was put behind it. And um, that's the one that I appreciate the most. All right, why don't we go with John next? And I'm going to choose Darren to start. I thought you were going to start doing any, meeny, miny, mo for that. (laughs) Who's going to go first? Uh, John. John's tough because I'm going to probably make an unpopular statement here. Uh, Several of his album covers to me are, to me, a little half-assed. Like mind games always struck me as something that I would have done in eighth grade art class. And the image of uh, as iconic as the cover of Imagine is, I still felt it was bland. There was something bland and unexciting about Imagine, an album cover that had potential. So my pick uh, is going to be, I didn't know what to go with here, thinking Double Fantasy, even some of the posthumous albums, Live in New York City's a striking cover, Men Love Avenue, striking cover. I'm going to go with John Lennon, Plastic Ono Band, because it is the exact opposite of the music. And that speaks volumes to me. You look at the cover of John Lennon, Plastic Ono Band, and you could lump in Yoko Ono, Plastic Ono Band. You look at those covers, peaceful, pastoral, calm you put the albums on and there's shrapnel flying all over the house you know (laughs) what i mean it's the exact opposite of what is being conveyed by the album cover especially yoko's album that that really you know and it to me it's just also just a out of left field random image let's put a picture of us sitting under a tree as the album cover that it, I really like it, but the fact that it really is the opposite of what the music is inside, it says so little. Maybe it even hurt the sales, actually, because unless you got a copy that had the shrink wrap with uh, one of those um, 
hype sticker. You look at the covers of John and Yoko's albums, they look identical, and it's like, who who's the artist? But such important, uh, in John's case, such an important album, an iconic album, and an album that, again, the content of the album is the complete light years different than what you see on the album cover. So John Lennon, Plastic Ono Band uh, is my pick. Wow, I never thought about that contrast right there. Interesting observation, though, Darren. Um, uh, I, I ate a lot of pizza. Uh, and that kind of like got the juices flowing in my head. And, uh. Alan, what's your favorite Lennon album cover? Well, I also chose John Lennon Plastic Ono Band, um, and I also hadn't hadn't thought of the contrast. Um, I'm not sure I necessarily buy the theory totally, but it's only just because I've just heard it. Um, uh, maybe if I think about it, I'll, I'll, I'll come around to agreeing that the the placid cover contrasts a lot with the... Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it does. It, it, it does to some degree in that, you know, this is the sort of primal scream album. Um, but, uh, you know, I just think that you can be sitting in front of a tree and have primal screams going on in your mind anyway, which clearly they were. I like the idea of the fact that the John Lennon and the Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Band albums were really being presented as a match set. Uh, you know, just who's leaning against who on the cover is the big difference. But you could turn the covers over and figure out whose record it was a, a bit more easily because the childhood pictures of each on the back makes it kind of clear uh, who's who. And also, you know, I mean, I remember from from when I was a kid and this these albums came out and John Lennon going on uh, radio interviews. I, I think he did this on Howard Smith and, uh, and other people too, uh, saying that, you know, if you take, uh, you know, Mother and... Uh, you know, paper shoes, I think it was, and you play them back to back, it's and, and you have a, you know, a crossfade that it, it, it just sort of makes sense together, you know, as an extended uh, track. And I, I thought that was sort of an interesting idea, the first track of each uh, record or just things that work together in John's mind. And uh, the fact that the backing bands were, you know, about the same and uh, the, and so the basic spare sound of the group was about the same these two albums really go together uh but you can still you know we're just talking about john so okay fine uh it's it's just a beautifully shot cover uh let's see dan richter who was john's um sort of assistant at the time he's he's all over that imagine documentary that came out last year uh john uh, dan richter took that photo and uh it's you know i just think a, a really really beautiful photo of the two of them leaning up against a you know gigantic old tree probably an oak i can't really tell from the leaves but because they're, they're sort of blurry but yeah i also picked john lennon plastic on a band mm, very interesting i was gonna go with that album but then i thought to myself I've always liked the front cover of Walls and Bridges, mm -hmm. mainly because they're drawings that John made in his childhood. Mm -hmm. And um, it just, he gives you, you know, a little bit of his history by showing something that he did. It actually says at the top of the album cover, age 11, June 1952. Mm -hmm. And there's a drawing of uh, a football match from uh, the 1952 FA Cup final. That's a drawing of his. And there's uh, half of a drawing of uh, face and uh, cowboys and Indians kind of thing. And uh, you have these flaps that you can turn over and you'll get John's uh, headshot with him sticking his uh, tongue out. And then as you, you know, turn that over, you get the full shot of the football match. So I just think the fact that he shared part of his childhood with us made it kind of special to me. And I do like the uh, the back cover of the Bob Gruen shot with five of uh, John's glasses going down his nose. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that album cover. I got to tell you, you know, it's, it's easy for me to talk about my favorite music from 
from the Beatles group and solo. I've never actually thought about what my favorite album covers are. I know which ones I like, but I never put together a list. You know, this is my number one. This is my number two. There are some that stick out in my memory a lot. And as someone who loves physical media like vinyl and CDs, and I don't really care for digital, you know, you'd think that maybe I'd spend more time looking at, you know, the front covers of albums. But, um, you know, there are some that just stick out on my memory more. And maybe for that reason, you know, I probably think of them as the ones that I appreciate the most. But um, I think Walls and Bridges holds that distinction for me. Although you could also say that rock and roll album cover mm. with the Jürgen Volmer photo is very historic right there. Um, so, but Walls and Bridges, I love a lot. All right? Yep. Yep. So let's move on now to uh, George. This time, Alan will begin. Okay. I'm going actually with a George reissue, which is the, uh, the, the latest iteration of All Things Must Pass. I could also say All Things Must Pass itself. Uh, the front covers are exactly the same, except that the reissue is colorized. It's a great shot of George sitting in his garden, and we know how important a garden was to George, uh, surrounded by garden gnomes who, you know, are sort of, you know, little strange figures that sort of pop up later in uh, George-related imagery. You know, I think uh, in in some of the videos, uh, you, you see people dressed as garden gnomes running around. Uh, Cracker Box Palace. Yeah. Um, now, inside, uh, the, the, the cover is by Barry Feinstein, and George sought permission from him to uh, play with the cover on the reissues rather than keeping it exactly as it was, uh, which was black and white. And in fact, uh, apart from the coloring, the front cover really is pretty much as it was. Um, inside the box, you open it up, you see the sort of, you know, Krishna symbols that, uh, you know, George made all of us familiar with, uh, printed purple on purple uh, inside the box. And then there is the booklet and the two CDs each have a new version of the front cover. Uh, on the booklet, you know, you still have George sitting there with his garden gnomes, but there is a huge overpass, you know, as if it's a, you know, a highway going right over his garden with, uh, you know, tall buildings behind it and an, a jet plane in the sky. And uh, if you, the, you look at one of the CDs, you see one, two, three, four, five nuclear reactors with smoke coming out of the top plus a couple of big um, apartment tower blocks. And then the other one, you see pretty much the same thing, but even more apartment tower blocks behind it. Uh, in fact, I think the booklet is like that second one, except with the highway overpass. Uh, you know, and he's he talked a little bit about this in the booklet, you know, that uh, it's a comment on the way the world has, uh, has changed since All Things Must Pass came out. Um, so that's it for me. I, I mean, I, I liked All Things Must Pass itself in its pure form originally. I think uh, the reissue sort of adds an extra layer of commentary that I really kind of like. Mm. Okay, Darren? Uh, my pick is Living in the Material World. It's a gorgeous cover. I couldn't tell you why I feel this way, but I feel like it captures the essence of what the music is inside. Uh, at least it does for me. Uh, I just think it's very eye catching. And um, it was kind of hard to pick between living in the material world and all things must pass and cloud nine. Uh, I went with living in the material world because it, it of, of, it's just this, it's a striking image and it captures uh, within um, the music within um, it captures the uh, the vibe of the of the music is what I'm trying to say. Mm. You mean because it has those coins in in the hand that's on the front cover, presumably George's hand, I guess. It is George's hand. No, uh, just I don't know. 
the uh, it's just there's something cosmic about it. You know what I'm saying? And that is the most cosmic spiritual album that George did. So why shouldn't the image on the cover on a, on a black background be this eye catching, colorful? I don't even know what to call the type of photography that was used, but it's it, it's mentioned in the I think in the liner notes, or at least I read it somewhere. And it is John's hand. So under certain, I guess, uh, lighting that picks up on, I don't know, the precursor to the mood ring, I guess you could say. Huh. Um, so living in the material world is my uh, my pick. Okay. Well, that's my favorite album of all time. That I know. So man. Yes. So I'm proud of you for saying that, Darren. <laughs> As album covers go, you know, it's real tough to pick because uh, – you know, kind of like what you just said, Darren, uh, All Things Must Pass has to be in there as well as Cloud Nine. I'm probably going to go with All Things Must Pass, in part because of what it represented at that time, the start of George's new life, even though it really technically wasn't his first solo album. But this was him, you know, on his lawn in his new estate with those gnomes around him. And to me, it just represented the beginning of uh, a brand new life for him. And... Um, you know, I also love the packaging inside with that poster of George in that hallway with the stained glass behind him. Really gave it a very spiritual effect mm -hmm. for me. So, you know, and then again, I do love Cloud Nine for that, that front cover there with George looking so happy with his fresh guitar uh, in front of those clouds behind him. So, but I think I'm going to go with All Things Must Pass, especially because of the historical significance of that album and the tremendous breakthrough that it was for him. All right, finally... Many, quick question. How many gnomes are on the cover? Isn't that supposed to be some sort of reference to the Beatles? I never heard that. Yeah, I, I, I heard that at some point. Uh, I don't know if there are three gnomes on the ground. There are four. Four gnomes? Mm -hmm. All right. Random thought. Mm, Onward. Interesting. Onward host. <laughs> that leaves us with one more Beatle. And that has to be Paul. So uh, this time out, we'll start with Darren. All right. Well, uh, Paul's hard for me. I find that many of McCartney's album covers disappoint me, but I'm being very picky. And I'll pick the most like little minute thing that annoys me about the cover. Uh, and my list was very short on ones that I found the fewest flaws and for for similar reasons that I picked Living in the Material World, the one I'll go with is Venus and Mars. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a striking image on the black background. Uh, the two pool, pool balls, uh, snooker, right? Snooker balls, uh -huh. I guess they are, uh, representing Venus and Mars. And this very kind of very 70s, very heady lyric on the cover. Venus and Mars are all right tonight. Okay, great, Paul. That's... <laughs> That says a lot and says nothing, and it works really uh, well with the uh, with the kind of uh, kind of heady, very seventies image of of, uh, of Venus and Mars. So that's that's my pick. Almost went with tug of war. Almost went with flowers in the dirt. Uh, tripping the life, fantastic, and even pure McCartney. But uh, Venus and Mars is my pick. Okay, I would never have thought that, only because of how simple it is. You know, in a way. But then simple can work. You know. There's, just look at Abbey Road. That's right. Alan, how about you? Okay, yeah, for me, Paul was tough too, but for the opposite reason of Darren. I, I, I think that, um, you know, Paul probably puts the most thought into his album covers of all of them. And some of them are not great. Some of them are great, but you know, there's, there's always uh, some sort of a concept where you, you feel that he didn't just say, yeah, just slap a picture of me on there. And, but the one I went with is actually a pretty simple one and it is McCartney. And that is partly, well, it's, it, it's a whole number of reasons, but it's partly because I saw the front cover as something entirely other than it was. We now know, um, having seen the deluxe edition, we've seen the raw photo of the front cover, which is the bowl of cherries on the, the, the wall that he took in Antigua. Uh, on vacation with Linda, or that Linda took uh, when they were on vacation in Antigua. 
the way I always saw it because of the way the picture is printed and the difference between it and the original picture uh, where the top of the wall with the cherry spilled all over it and the, the bowl of cherry juice is now surrounded by absolute black, right? So to me, that looked like it's one of the stripes on the Abbey Road crosswalk with a spilled bowl of cherries on it. And that to me was completely a comment on, you know, the state of things for, for Paul at the time, you know, life was a bowl of cherries. Here it is all spilled out on the Abbey Road crosswalk, their last album cover. You know what I mean? Um, seemingly he didn't intend it that way, or maybe he did, but uh, there's no clue that he intended it that way in the discussion of it in the uh, Super Deluxe book. So the back cover, which I think was originally supposed to be the front cover, has his name on it, has the title, the title of the album, and, you know, the picture of Paul in a, a nice warm coat with Mary, still a baby, tucked into it. Really sweet picture. And the gatefold mm. is lots of pictures of the family and of Paul being with the family. And um, I'm going to steal something from my co-writer, Adrian Sinclair, on this book. Um, Adrian feels, and you know, the more we talk about it, the more I agree, is that the McCartney album is Paul's equivalent of John's wedding album except in Paul's terms. I mean, this is all about, you know, his family, his love of family, his love of Linda, uh, you know, the whole thing. And, and that includes the cover and the pictures, uh, you know, which are mostly, almost entirely pictures taken by Linda. A couple might have been taken by Paul. But it's them. It's the family. It's a family album, you know, meaning about family, not that it's, you know, like rated PG necessarily, but uh, it probably is. But still, uh, to me, that that the cover says an awful lot. It may say more than it actually says, but that's why I've picked that one. Wow, that's very interesting. There, I think the back cover would have worked better as the front cover. Possibly, but we're kind of used to it the way it is. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, but do do we know why that was done? Uh, where the covers, and well, to our eyes, is reversed, uh, and maybe that's not how ever it was ever intended. And is there any word on what, in Paul's estimation, the cover meant? The ch cherries. He's never said anything. Not that I found yet. Um, so uh, you know, I I don't know. It, it could be that my interpretation is 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 correct, but uh, he's never said so. Mm. It's left up to us mm. for our own interpretation, I guess. And, hmm. and that's what great art does. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for me, I'm going to go with Tug of War, uh, mainly because I love the shot of Paul there with the headphones on. It looks like he's in, lost in some train of thought there. I like the grids around it, the different colors. From what I understand, if you walk into Abbey Road in the hallway, they have those same colors the like tiles and i think that's where they got that backdrop from i'm not totally sure you were at abbey road right I was. Yeah. yeah uh darren so do, do yeah you know i was what, what i don't i don't recall i don't yeah. remember I don't but do i thought it was a very artistic yeah i thought it was a very artistic shot there of paul and it's just something very striking that that stays with you after you look at it and um just like the look of seeing paul with headphones on you know, mm -hmm. and that would be it for me. I mean, there's there's so many really good album covers. I think from Paul, some of them I do feel are very effortless, like um, Driving Rain. You know, it's like take a selfie of yourself and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's uh, like Band on the Run is a great artistic album cover there with the band and and the actors that surrounded them at the time for that shot. The Back to the Egg album cover, I think, is very artistic. I love those, you know. But for whatever reason, I, I, you know, Tug of War, which is a special album for me, one of many from Paul, I just love that particular shot. I think it was just the perfect shot to use for the, for the front cover. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so that wraps up our conversation on this. If our listeners would like to offer their thoughts of what their favorite album covers are, when it comes to the group, I don't even know how you pick sometimes because, like I said, they're all iconic. They're all special in their own way. Mm-hmm. You know, even a simple photo. I was asking my wife about it, and she loves the the Beatles for sale. The shot of the Beatles there. Yeah, uh, I don't. I, you know, it's striking in its own way. It you is. Their, their faces say so much at different times in their lives, and sometimes a close up of their faces, the expressions on their faces, add so much to you know your thoughts about how you feel about that that photo. And um, so yeah, everyone has different tastes, and you know you can appreciate something as elaborate as Sgt. Pepper and something as simple as the White Album or Abbey Road. And uh, this was interesting. So if you would like to write to us here at the show uh, your thoughts about your favorite album covers, we always give out our email address here. It's things we said today radio show at gmail.com. And why don't we now give out our own contact information? We'll start with you, Alan. Okay, the easiest way to get to me is through Facebook, um, where I have two homes. One is just Alan Cozen, and the other is Alan Cozen Remixed, which is really more of my Beatles life. Alan Cozen is more of my classical music life. Um, But they overlap uh, now and then, so either way, write to me there. That's fine. Apart from our email address, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com, we also have a, a Twitter feed, which is uh, at things we said fab. And we have a Facebook page, things we said today, Beatles radio fans. I believe there is also a things we said today Facebook page without the Beatles radio fans. Um, so any of those places, you can find us all. All right, Darren, and you? All right, well, you're good to go to Facebook. I have two pages as well. Uh, I would prefer, if uh, uh, you didn't mind, to go to the radio page, which has the longer title. Uh, I know some of you have friended me at my uh, at my personal page, Darren DeVivo, and I'm usually uh, then sending a message saying, thanks, do you mind going over to Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio? Can to type the whole name into the search box. Uh, Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. That's on Facebook. If you want to shoot me a personal email, just write me at WFUV. My name's spelled out D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O at WFUV dot org. Okay. As for me, my email address is everylittlething at att dot net. Don't forget, I have another podcast show. It's on the Solo Beatles called Talk More Talk. It's on every other Monday night at 9 p.m. on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a Solo Beatles video cast. The show, by the way, was just picked up on iHeartRadio. And for that reason, I have uh, a trivia question on my website where I have weekly Beatles trivia. And it all concerns the word heart in the titles of Solo Beatles songs. So if you like challenging Beatles trivia... Just go to my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. You can win one of nine great prizes every single week there, along with uh, catching lots of great interviews that I've done throughout my career on the website. Again, that's kenmichaelsradio.com. All right. Thanks so much for joining us. This has been a great conversation. And special thanks to Jennifer Ballantyne at the Universal Music Group for helping us get the interview with John Kosh. Thanks to John for doing the interview with us. And for Darren DeVivo and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.